Richard Sennett, uh, in his uh, latest book, uh, stemming from his long uh, uh, standing research work on cities' life, um, underlines two meanings uh, historically attached to the idea of what a city is. Okay? And uh, from the French, he says this uh, the ville and the city. No? It is the built environment and how people dwell in it. No? It calls the city of stones, the city of people. Oh, today, this distinction is no more in use. But uh, as Senate and knowledge is a very old one, but even older than Senate openly admits. Uh, the distinguished scholar Emile Benveniste has long since demonstrated that such opposition is a basic one in all Indo-European languages, and particularly in Latin and Greek, because uh, there is a fundamental differences, difference in the, the ways the two cultures meant citizenship. No? While both kept this distinction between uh, the two kinds of cities, for the Greeks, it was the belonging to the city which made the inhabitants citizens, while for the Latins, it was the community of citizens, the ground on which the entire city relied. So this cultural distinction uh, is relevant to our topic for its emphasis on the necessity of thinking about the cities, taking into account the two sides of the urban coin. So the two cities, so to speak, at once, as a whole. And this approach is all the more important today since mainstream urban planning is still too focused on the city of stones, the built environment, while at the same time, the city of people is undergoing a radical change. On the other hand, the same idea of built environment is misleading in itself since, as Senate uh, remarks, buildings are seldom isolated facts. Now I wonder, what if planning solutions, besides overlooking the relation between the two components of the cities, but even taking into account the social side at their best, what if they were applied to a vanishing social fabric? So what about relational sustainability? This is the question of my intervention. So I need to be uh, a little too assertive, uh, for which I apologize in advance. First of all, I will point out the unbalanced view on cities by most urban planning, along with the dissolution of societal bonds, once characterizing the way we were used to think society. Then I will show some recent examples of urban renovation projects and their side effects being actually most collateral damage to the relation between the two cities. Finally, I will introduce a last example, which is really a best practice, while an unplanned one. All on the ground of an hypothesis, which is the basis of a research project being carried out in my department. So. Everyone knows the traditional social containers, nation states, households, educational institutions are challenged by the proliferation, spreading a massive influence of the so-called social media. Even in politics today, where by now, communication through social media has become a prominent battlefield to gain and keep public consensus, like an endless election campaign. Fact is that, notwithstanding this situation was foreshadowed already in the 60s by some urban planning scholars like Melvin Weber, the practice of public urban planning is still anchored to an old fallacy, the so-called therapeutic illusion of space. On the one hand, today one belongs to different and delocalized communities of interest. 
and the quantity and intensity of individual interactions are no longer a direct function of proximity and population density. On the other end, the constant attempt to characterize one's own experiences relative to places is not abandoned. This is the missing link of planning in which resides the gap between the sources. Planning still seems disinclined or unwilling to give up the old therapeutic illusion of space. The idea of improving cities' life by operating on built environment, assuming in doing this, that there is a natural overlapping between physical space and social space, while it is not the case. No more. Besides, oh, the social tensions fueled by the crisis come from a dissolving social terrain, which, as Alain Touraine has long demonstrated, is so composed of individuals who increasingly do not consider themselves in social terms, but rather in cultural terms. For short, political and even social rights are losing ground compared to cultural rights. In the face of the universalism of political rights, we are seeing ever more the insular concerns of cultural rights. Below the global struggle for citizenship, which is shown as the core of the question of immigration, they are working cultural claims that are always specific and particular. This is not just a consequence of the absence of any technological determinism already noted by Manuel Castells in Information Society, which clearly separate us from the industrial society where the technical division of labor was not separable from the social relations of production, but also an outcome of the separation of the globalized economy from institutions which existing only at lower levels, national, local, regional, are unable to control economies that operate at much broader level. It is also the same result that leads to the perception of violence, wars, system of repression. Modern states were created through the wars, while current conflicts have no political or social function. A war is no longer the other side of a social conflict. All these remarks converge on the same point, the fall and disappearance of the universe that we are called social. What is mostly relevant to our argument, it is the fact that the overlapping between social space and national space as a consequence of national states prevailing territorial form worldwide, it was also the ground on which legitimate expectations and hopes toward equality and democracy were built and defended. But what now? In this context, how can we think and especially share a European heritage? How can we talk about our towns and landscapes as towns and landscapes, for example, both Hungarians and European? It is not an idle question, not at all, in my opinion, to share with others something abstract and yet quite concrete like a city or a landscape, to feel them as a living parts of everyday life, it is not enough to trust only our humanist culture. The challenge we face first is to bridge the gap between the so-called art and soft sciences. But fortunately, as it often happens, art is a great help. Go? Okay. In the latest movie uh, by Agnès Varda, in collaboration with the street artist Jean René, we have a small example of what I'm trying to tell. First of all, the title, whose translation into Hungarian is interesting because in keeping the pun of the original French title, it smartly improves it, relating the outline of faces to the edge of streets. The movie is basically a trip across France with a special van able to turn into a photo booth in which the portraits of people encountered are printed as big billboards or wallpapers and installed on the places where they live and work. 
Of course, the movie cannot show the whole relational substance which movie makers and people shared, but it is a good distillation of it. The entire movie deals with issues related to my speech and to the project to which I referred earlier. But there is an episode which is particularly worth mentioning. A ghost village, Peru, in Normandy, on the channel, more precisely, also in La Manche, huh? okay? <laughs> 70 unfinished houses, never inhabited. A real estate speculation, of course, but rather clumsy, it seems. No network, no water, no electricity, no road. Its demolition has already been decided by the city council, but Agnès Varda and JR, during their journey through France, bring to life, for once, the village. Yes, it's the Hungarian version. <laughs> Pas oublier les images de tes films. Le visage de Cléo. J'ai adoré voir depuis le train les yeux que tu as collés sur des containers. Ce qui est drôle, c'est qu'on ne se soit pas croisé depuis le temps. Le truc rigolo, c'est qu'on va faire un film ensemble. Bah ouais, c'est ça le point de départ. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on va faire Et On va faire des images ensemble, mais autrement. Tu sais, c'est avec ce camion que je pars partout dans le monde. Les gens y entrent à l'arrière, comme dans un photomaton, et la photo sort dans les 5 secondes sur le côté, en grand format. C'est ça. On apprend à se connaître. Merci d'être venu. Je dis bonjour qu'aux qu jeunes. Bah oui, parce qu'ils sont à ta taille. <rire> Chaque visage a une histoire. Je sais pas quoi dire. Un, deux, trois. Déjà, je pensais pas que l'image serait aussi grande. C'est vraiment l'idée que j'ai répond à ce que je souhaite le plus. Les visages que je rencontre, oh les photographies, pour qu'ils ne tombent pas aussitôt dans les trous de ma mémoire. Alors, ce que je te propose, c'est que je t'aide dans le magazine et le plus d'images avant tout foutre le camp. Ça s'est très bien imprimé sur des petites assiettes de porcelaine. <rire> C'est beau, hein C'est le jeu. <rire> Ce train ira dans plus d'endroits où tu n'iras jamais. En fait, tu vois flou et t'es contente. Et toi, tu vois tout foncé. Et tu es content. Arrête parce qu'elle essaie de me faire enlever les lunettes. Un visage, c'est beau. Le but, c'est le pouvoir de l'imagination. Les seules assures, les chapeaux sont mis à autorisation. Alors, si, alors, moi, je vais vous dire quelque chose entre nous. Toutes les amendes, vous pouvez les envoyer à Agnès Varda. D'accord. Tous discutent, quoi. So, this is a small example of what we can call the place's mind. It is obvious that the staging in the margin, so to speak, implies the time that has been lived and shared between those who are on the screen and those who were behind the lens of the camera. But this is an outlier among other episodes. All the other places of the movie strip were lived, inhabited, while Peru was never inhabited. In addition, the city council has decided to use the land now free for other real estate projects, despite research and studies driving, drawing public attention to the risks of building on a coast threatened by erosion and submersion. In this small example, you have the mind of places, just the very essence of the common life. This lively interaction I'm trying to portray an interaction that can be an alliance or a misalliance. And all of this is not due to chance. It is a question of choice and therefore eminently political in the highest sense of the term. Given that the most relevant theories about human mind have established that our minds are not just computing machines processing information, but indeed they are producers and processors of meaning, and that minds are not in our heads but in the interactions 
between our bodies, our brains, and physical places. The hypothesis driving the project is that not only basically any city is smart. There's not, there are not smart cities, that the cities are not smart, but any city is smart. But also that the issue at stake is which options planning and decision making select among the many evolutionary paths a city can follow. As a basic tenet on which the previous statements ground, the city, seen as an original human environment, is possibly the oldest known form of artificial intelligence, we know. Which means, as a corollary, that the richness of urban cultural heritage is hardly represented by the mainstream definitions. We can say that the urban intelligence, the mind of the cities, resides in the daily interactions between the urban built environment and the bodies and brains of the inhabitants which deep mixes thoughts, feelings, desires, fears, hopes, by constituting the true stuff, dreams, of all those who live in the city are made of. Like all intelligence, to serve the common good, it should not be taken for granted, because it is always a matter of choice. In order to consciously choose, citizens must not only share the material part, but above all, a shared education to the good use of the mind of the city, seeking the reconstruction of the relationships between needs and resources, knowledge and practices. Now, to finish, to bring this picture to an end, I have some examples of not best practices, but worst practices of cultural heritage. And finally, a best practice, but an unplanned practice. Okay. So let us see how can heritage be enlisted as an only an economic resource. So I'm balancing the relation between built environment and city dwellers. In the case of Mediterranean cities, through the promotion of international events like Olympic Games, World Cups, World Fairs, G8, urban renewal programs concerning cities, above all these areas like Docklands, or considering decay, European programs like the European Capital of Culture, we have witnessed a huge and enduring flow of public and private investments, which radically has been transforming large areas of Mediterranean cities on both shores, mostly led by the monopoly rent logic, especially in the case of waterfronts and historic centers, the extensive use of territorial marketing or city branding has produced very cultural, uh, popular cultural places like the Museum of Contemporary Art Donna Regina in Naples, but also the huge project for Barcelona, and the Marseille waterfront Euro Mediterranean. The same logic also applies to the regeneration public um, program in Tunis, as well as to the waterfront projects in Tanger and Casablanca, all mainly driven by investments of global players coming from the Gulf countries. In all these cases, what Harvey calls the art of rent is the very engine of change. Such programs, indeed, while enhancing disused or unoccupied areas through the spillover effect on the rent, increase nearby property prices in surrounding districts, so reducing affordable housing in favor of high-income residential lots and forcing the relocation of low-income residents. Monopoly rent follows a logic which, while investing in concrete, even literally, material things, like buildings and infrastructures, it is anyway mainly linked to financial market, whose very nature is global. In order to attract external investment, cities have to accept competition on international scale, 
then implementing big plans and urban developments radically changing not only areas somehow abandoned, but also the neighborhoods bordering the areas involved. I'll show you just the last example. It's Palermo. Palermo is an unplanned uh, change of this kind. Um, and what, what is interest, uh, interesting in this uh, example, that uh, there was a very uh, long-standing specu speculation legacy from the mafia, from all the investments on the fire in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, with uh, the abandonment uh, uh, of uh, the historic center, it was recently renovated, but with uh, a new agreement between uh, the municipality council, the city council, a culture council, with a shared culture council with the immigrants and the immigrants. So the effect, the effect was that according to the numbers, just to give some, not only uh, the population of residents has been growing, and it still is in 25 years, more than 60% of the city's historic buildings have been renovated. But also the little neighborhood businesses are thriving, namely the local street markets, which were a really long standing tradition since the 10th century. So, in a sense, uh, this was really not uh, a planning example, but it's an example of how, in any moment, a city can ch choose to uh, work on what we try to call the, the mind of the city. The mind of the city is the, the interaction between people, the built environment, and uh, the perspective on needs and resources. So, working together on this in a long perspective, of course, can, be, uh, can activate the smartness that any city has. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.